Uh, let me now introduce the second speaker, Dr. Sevelyaraha Supermanian. Dr. Selva is an ob consultant and a subspecialist in reproductive medicine at a private hospital in Melaka, Malaysia, where he also heads both the IVF Center and the HIFU Center. His initial training in laparoscopic surgery was under Professor Sung Kui Yong and Dr. Li Chi Leong at the Changgu Memorial Hospital, Taipei in 1994. He is a past president of APH and the Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Malaysia and is involved in promoting gynecological endoscopic surgery in Malaysia. He started the first HIFU Center in Malaysia in 2021. With his experiences, he will speak on how HIFU can help with infertility secondary to adenomyosis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, uh, I would like to thank APH as well and also International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery for inviting me to give this lecture entitled Infertility with Adenomyosis, How Can HIFU Help? Now, before I start this lecture, let me say that I have been only doing HIFU for the last one year, maybe 13 months. I started in July last year. And my experience is not as great as many of the other surgeons probably in the world, uh, especially those from China, uh, those from Korea, and also those from Taiwan. The only difference is that I am also a fertility specialist. I've been doing IVF for the last 28 years. I'm also a laparoscopic surgeon. I've been doing that for the last 30 years. So with this experience, and now that I've started HIFU, I probably can give a different overview on how adenomyosis can help in infertility. So this is my disclosure. I run a HIFU, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU center at Makuta Medical Center, Malacca. Now, uh, when we look at HIFU, there are different types of, um, uh, look at adenomyosis, there different types of adenomyosis. By ultrasound, we usually say adenomyosis as diffuse adenomyosis or focal adenomyosis or adenomyoma. And this is a very good book uh, edited by my friend, Dr. Felix Wong. And this gives you a very good overview of uh, adenomyosis. Now, if you look at ultrasound diagnosis of adenomyosis uh, published in this ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology, there are actually many criteria, there's altogether eight criteria. The criteria that we normally do is an asymmetric enlargement of the endometrium, uh, of the myometrium, the presence of small, uh, uh, what you call as uh, cyst, hypoechoic islands, and also big islands, and also the others are the shadowing, uh, blood supply, uh, uh, break of the junctional zone, blood in, in, inside the adenomyosis, and also break in the functional zone. So this is different, different ways in which we make ultrasound diagnosis of adenomyosis. Now, if we look at uh, MRI, the situation is much more different. We also, uh, uh, what we call classify adenomyosis by uh, we're calling them diffuse internal adenomyosis, external adenomyosis, and adenomyoma. And here you can see different categories of adenomyosis in MRI. Uh, they are subdivided into internal adenomyosis, adenomyoma, and also external adenomyosis. And in the internal adenomyosis, there are A, B, C, D, and E. You can see there are minor ones and also major ones, which we classically call them as diffuse adenomyosis up to E. Then we have adenomyomas, which can present in different areas, for example, in the intramural area, in the submucosal area, and also in the subserosal area. Then, of course, the more difficult ones, which are the external adenomyosis, where you can have it in the posterior wall, infiltrating into the rectum, or anterior wall, infiltrating into the uh, bladder. So we must understand that adenomyosis is actually a varied disease. And when it comes to HIFU, as I will describe later, treatment can be different and can be difficult. Now, when we look at adenomyosis, there are two different types of patients. The first group of patients are those with adenomyosis who do not want to conceive, but still want to retain their uterus. The second one are those who want to conceive. And this is what we are going to look at today. I'm not going to talk about this part, which is actually the easy part of the surgery. Those who, with adenomyosis who want to conceive are the ones that gives us the biggest headache. 
So this is what I'm going to discuss today. Now, for those who want to conceive, what is the options we have now? We have adenomyomectomy, as what uh, has been said by Professor Rudy. It is not an easy surgery. It's a very difficult surgery. I do it by laparoscopy, and I'm, I think the next speaker will be speaking on it. It's not very easy to do this surgery. And whenever I do this surgery, I always worry that if they get pregnant, whether I'm going to get a uterine rupture. The other option, one, what IVF specialists usually do is we give, they give them GnRH analogs or Dinogest, and then hoping that they will have a shrinkage of the adenomyosis and the patient can have a spontaneous pregnancy, or if they have frozen embryo, we do a frozen embryo transfer. This is what we have been doing all these years. Now, we know what HIFU is. It has been discussed uh, in the, by Dr. Professor Rudy. It is HIFU uses focused ultrasound beam to ablate adenomyosis. And we are using ultrasound beam to uh, uh, heat up the tissues in a focal point in the adenomyosis and cause the adenomyosis to die. So what are the advantages of ultrasound-based HIFU? This is asked, somebody asked this question. There are two types of uh, HIFU machines available in the world. This is the MRI-based HIFU. This is ultrasound-based HIFU. And in, in my mind, the advantage one is that ultrasound-based HIFU is actually real-time ultrasound imaging. We do it one second at a time, whereas in the MRI-based HIFU is not real-time. You actually have a, a, a time where the machine will be shooting the beam for 20 seconds where you've got no vision at all. So it's not real time. And also one of the other advantages, the transducers used during the ultrasound-based cycle are larger and more powerful as opposed to that during the MRI-based cycle. So we can give much bigger energy for a longer duration in uh, ultrasound-based cycle compared to the MRI-based cycle. The, there's a better transducer movement during an ultrasound-based HIFU. If you look at the ultrasound-based HIFU, it can actually move 12 centimeters on either direction and front, back, up, and down, whereas the movement in the ultrasound-based HIFU is very minimal. And that, that is the reason why it is far more powerful than that of the MRI-based HIFU. Because of that, you can have a shorter operating time using the MRI-based HIFU as opposed to an uh, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU as opposed to the MRI-based HIFU. I think the most important thing is that because of all these advantages, there is a better success rate. You can get a higher non-perfusion volume after an ultrasound-based HIFU compared to an MRI-based HIFU. The biggest advantage of MRI-based HIFU is that you can have temperature monitoring in the MRI-based HIFU as opposed to the ultrasound-based HIFU. And also the images are far better in an MRI-based HIFU than an ultrasound-based HIFU. But these are the advantages of an ultrasound-based HIFU. Now, what are the benefits of HIFU for an adenomyosis patient? It is non-invasive, as has been discussed. When shrinkage of adenomyosis occurs, the uterus will become smaller and it will be more amenable to pregnancy. This is what we are trying to achieve. There is a reduction in symptoms, namely menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea. The patient can start conceiving after about four months after treatment. When you see there's a shrinkage of the uterus, then the patient can start conceiving. And also the patient can even have a normal delivery after treatment because there's no scar in the uterus. And this is the big advantage compared to adenomyomectomy where you have a big scar and we don't know what is going to happen. We definitely have to do a cesarean section, but we are worried that the patient may have a uterine rupture while she is pregnant. Now, this is my experience. My experience is not big, it's limited. It's about 13 months. And uh, I have done 112 cases of adenomyosis, 140 cases of fibroid, and 17 cases of adenomyosis and fibroid, a total of 269 as of yesterday. And here, this is the first HIFU case that I was doing with my teacher, Dr. Huang, who is now in Changsha. It's nice for her to come down and spend three months with me to teach me how to perform HIFU. And now I perform HIFU on my own. This is the HIFU center in my hospital. It's a small room with this machine in, the, in, in it. And uh, we do this surgery here uh, in Makota Medical Center. Now, what are the principles of HIFO ablation? What is the difference between ablating a fibroid as opposed to ablating an endomyosis? And this is important because there are two different things and the, the way in which we do is also difficult and different. Now, we, when we see a, a fibroid, it's got a capsule. It's very well encapsulated. So when you give energy into it, it is, it is a, this is a contrast MRI, and you can see that it's well encapsulated. So when you can give energy, the energy will be contained within the capsule, and you can maintain it. And you can see here, I have done, I have done this MRI-based high food. We can keep the uh, energy within. This is another small fibroid. 
Now, this is not the same for adenomyosis. As you can see, an adenomyosis patient will have adenomyosis all over the uterus. If you're lucky, it's in one place. Like this patient has got an adenomyosis behind and also in front. And we must try and ablate as much as for this, this uh, disease as possible. And so the ablation is difficult and, and, and can, be diff uh, can be very uh, frustrating and difficult because we cannot get to every uh, area of the adenomyosis. So this is far different, far difficult and far different from that of uh, fibroid. Now, what is the difference in performing HIFU for patients who want to conceive and not keen to conceive? There are two differences. There, it's a big difference between these two. Now, for a patient who do not want to conceive, in patients who do not want to conceive, we can do extensive ablation can be performed, and this can even include endometrial cavity. The success rate of reducing symptoms is higher in this case. So if the patient doesn't want to get pregnant, I can ablate as much as I can, and even involving the endometrial cavity, although we try to avoid that, and we can do that kind of ablation. So the success rate of reducing menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea is far higher, as opposed to a patient who want to conceive the ablation will need to be done more carefully to avoid ablating the endometrium. In this case, the ablation will be limited and the success in reducing symptom will be lesser as the energy will be given to the adenomyotic area. So this is very important because when we are doing endo, uh, adenomyosis patient in patients who do not get, uh, want to get pregnant, it is different from that with the patient who want to get pregnant because the amount of energy that we need to be given must be very controlled so that it, if possible, we don't want to hit, hit the endometrial cavity. So I always tell my patient that if, if you want to get pregnant, my ablation will, be, will not be so extensive and your chances of the uh, getting back the disease will be much higher than if you do not want to get pregnant. So what are the challenges in ablating adenomyosis? So not all adenomyosis scales are the same. I showed you all just now that there are different types of adenomyosis in different positions and different areas, and not all of them are the same. And in some cases, there is a gap between the adenomyosis and the endometrial cavity. So that there's a gap between the junctional zone and the adenomyosis. In these cases, the chances of reaching the endometrial cavity is lesser. In others, the adenomyosis reaches up to the endometrial cavity, breaching the transformation zone. Here, it is very easy to reach the endometrial cavity. So the energy must be given, must be low and very controlled. And this can be very difficult. Now, I also, I always wonder whether, I wonder whether endometrium that has already been involved by the adenomyosis, whether reaching the endometrium will be beneficial as probably new endometrium will grow over the ablated endometrium. I've been taught that I shouldn't reach, but in many cases, so what if I reach the endometrium? If the, if the endometrium has already been affected by the adenomyosis, if I ablate it, will it be better? Will it be actually better for the patient? Actually, nobody knows the answer to this question. I can give you an example here. This is a patient with adenomyosis. She has an adenomyosis that is from here right up to the endometrial cavity. You can see that it's bulging into the endometrial cavity. And I did the ablation as carefully as I can, it still reached the endometrial cavity. Now this patient wants to get pregnant. Will her pregnancy be affected? Actually, we don't know. Now here I can show you another case. This is a case of a, 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 a patient with adenomyosis. This adenomyosis is quite extensive. As you can see, it is involving all around the endometrium. And this is the uh, MRI showing the adenomyosis. You can see that it is involving the front and the posterior part of the uterus. This is the ex this is my treatment. And when, when, when I did the treatment, it was very difficult. She was 39 years old, the doctor, and she she's she not sure whether she wants to get pregnant, she may get married. And this is the ablation that I did. And you can see that even I, after how much I controlled, there was still an endometrial involvement. And this is the adenomyosis after three months. And three months, you can see that the ablation here has been and uh, has been uh, uh, has reached the endometrium, but not that much. And I was fortunate to do a hysteroscopy for her recently, and this is how the hysteroscopy looked. Just to give you an idea that I reached the endometrium, and the part of the endometrium was actually ablated. And here is how it looks, and you can see that. This part of the endometrium is normal, you can see, and the top part is normal, but the lateral part, the, the right lateral part, there was some uh, tissue that is necrotic tissue involved in, in uh, showing that this part of the endometrium has been ablated. So this patient actually, I removed all this necrotic tissue and then put in a marina, hoping 
uh, hoping that the endometri the the adenomyosis will not recur. So uh, the question to ask is: if you reach the endometrium, is that bad for the patient? Can she get pregnant with this normal endometrium? And also, can this ablated endometrium regrow? In my mind, I think it will it will grow back, and she will probably this patient will probably has a chance to get pregnant. So here in this, in this uh, uh, lecture, I'm going to concentrate on different types of patients. We, when we look at adenomyosis patients, there are different types of adenomyosis patients. There are, of course, those who are not keen to get pregnant, and then there are the ones who, want, who are keen to get pregnant. And those who are keen to get pregnant, they are, I divide them to three types. One is a patient who has frozen embryo, and the second is the patient who is still single, and the third patient is a patient who is keen on spontaneous pregnancy. And of course, there's one group of patients who is uns unsure whether she wants to conceive. These are the patients who are in the late 30s who are single, and we don't know whether they, uh, I mean, she, she wants to get pregnant, probably if she gets a partner. So in this particular lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on these two the groups of patients with a little bit on this patient who still want to get pregnant. So these are the patients that we see in our practice as IVF specialists and also patients taking care of uh, who, uh, patients who want to get pregnant. So let's look at the first group, a patient who has frozen embryo. I like this group of patients because uh, as I will tell you, these patients are the best for uh, the group who wants to get pregnant. Now, in this group of patients, we must ablate, the ablation need to be done very carefully to prevent involvement of the endometrium as I showed, as I showed earlier. And I usually give them GnRH analog for three months. And after three months, I plan that the embryo transfer should be done after three months of five weeks, irrespective of whether the patient has got commences. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is at the, at the, in the beginning, what I was doing is I was waiting for the patient to get their periods and then do the embryo transfer. And I realized that the time when the uterus is the smallest in size is at around three months, because that is a time when the effect of the GnRH is the maximum and also the uterus has shrunk to the smallest size. Although the, the, the uh, adenomyosis has not still is shrinking, but after that, what will happen is because the GnRH analog wears off, the uterus becomes larger. I'll show an example of a patient later. So I, in my mind, this is the best time to do the embryo transfer instead of waiting for the periods and then do the embryo transfer. Now I'll give you all an example. This is a case study. This lady is Madam CLF, a 35-year-old lady married for five years with no children. She underwent an IVF in 2019 and she had two frozen embryos. Uh, uh, she had two frozen embryos. She was given one dose of generation analogs after this frozen embryo depot, which is a three months one. In 2020, she underwent a laparoscopy and she was given again another uh, generation analog. This one is monthly for two months. Now, after that, they did an embryo transfer in June 2021. She did not conceive. Now, she was referred to me and she, and she complained of severe dysmenorrhea and heavy menses. She was on transanemic acid to control the bleeding. Now, when I saw her, her uterus was 16 weeks size and ultrasound showed a large posterior adenomyosis and the size was 9.63 times 10.84 times 8.6. Five, six centimeters. And this is how the adenomyosis looked. This is the adenomyosis. And this is the MRI showing the adenomyosis. And you can see that it was an enormous adenomyosis involving most part of the uterus. And this is the uh, what it, uh, transverse scan. This is the right side and this is the left side. And you can see that the adenomyosis is actually bulging into the endometrial cavity. And this is how the uh, the uh, uh, MRI look. It's, it's a large adenomyosis bulging into the endometrial cavity. So we did the HIFU. This was, I did the HIFU with my teacher, Dr. Huang, uh, and uh, she underwent HIFU uh, in September 2nd, 2021. And this was the, those who do HIFU will probably understand this. Uh, we use, I use, we use a maximum of 400 watts and the average was 400 watts. The, the duration of the surgery was 143 seconds. We sonicated for 1,635. This is generally considered quite a long surgery. Sonication elapsed time was 668. We used a total energy of uh, 65,000, uh, uh, 654,000 joules of energy. Estimated volume was 5.55. And this is, uh, we use 400 watts for all the ablation. So this was the 
uh, uterus at the end of three months. I didn't have, I didn't do the MRI immediately after the surgery for this patient. And this after three months, and this is how it looked. Uh, it was okay. I think we actually reached the endometrial cavity. We couldn't have uh, not reached the endometrial cavity. And this is the transverse view of the, of the finding. You can, you can see that the endometrium, we have actually reached the endometrial cavity. So this is the uh, MRI of the patient. Um, the volume of the uterus before surgery, this on the 17th of August, 2021, was 940 centimeter cubed. Uh, after about one and a half months, it came down to 448 centimeter cubed. And you must remember that I, after the procedure, we actually gave her three months uh, GMH and logs. And at uh, about uh, three months later, the volume was 318.6 centimeter cubed. And at around six months, it was 265. This one, this one of the earlier, earlier cases that I actually waited for six months, it was 265. So the volume reduction of the uterus, not the adenomyosis of the uterus was 71.8% volume reduction. So it's a very successful surgery. And I, I am very sure that I didn't have, I didn't do a office uh, hysteroscopy on her before or after the ablation. And I'm quite sure that part of the endometrium must be ablated in this patient. So I sent her back to a high risk IVF specialist for frozen embryo transfer. The IVF specialist also repeated a CA125 and found that it was high, it was 76.6. So she gave her another course of generation analog uh, for three months. And the CA125 after two months reduced to 20.7 international unit after two months. And then she did an embryo transfer without inducing any bleeding. Um, she gave progynova two milligrams three times a day for 11 days, and then she added eutrogestin and did the frozen embryo transfer on the 25th of June, just recently, 2022. And she just informed me that the patient is currently six, nine weeks pregnant. So this is my second case of pregnancy after uh, HIFU for adenomyosis. The first case is this one. Uh, before HIFU, another huge uterus, about almost 18 weeks size, both anterior and posterior. I did the ablation again, I must have reached the endometrial cavity. And this was at three months, the uterus shrunk. And uh, this actually had two months, and I immediately sent her to my friend uh, to do the frozen embryo transfer. He actually did the frozen embryo transfer. The patient actually conceived, but unfortunately, she miscarried. So he has given her another GNR channel lock, and he's going to do a frozen embryo transfer soon. So the uh, HIFO so the, in, in HIFO patient with frozen embryo transfer, the difficulty in these patients is to decide when is the best time to do the frozen embryo transfer. Uh, I am giving GNRH uh, depot, which is which lasts for three months after HIFU for my adenomyosis cases. The reason is that um, in my country, we include this into the insurance. And so it's paid by insurance. I know in China, my teacher tells me that they give monthly uh, GNRH analog. So in my limited experience, the shrinkage of adenomyosis after HIFU and, and, uh, and at three months, GNRH is the maximum uh, and at the three months post HIFU. So when we give, uh, when we do high food treatment for adenomyosis, and then we give the three months generation analog, the maximum effect, the smallest size is actually at around three months. And that's the reason why I'm making the suggestion that, that and, and, and after the uterus expand, after that, after three months, the uterus will expand due to the wearing effect of the generation analog and spontaneous menses usually occurs at four to six months after the generation log. So currently I'm advising all my patients frozen embryo transfer at three months post high food, even before the return of menstruation. So this is what I have been now uh, suggesting to my patient. So now let, let's look at the second group of patients, which is the patient who are still single. Now, these patients, we also need to do careful ablation without involvement of the endometrium. I also give them generation analog for three months. And then I ask the patients to, to take one of the followings, either Mirena, Dinogest, Depo-Provera injection, continuous oral contraceptive pills, or Implanon. My favorite is Mirena, but many of these patients are single, do not want, and they are Virgo and Tecta, they may not want Mirena. So we will give them Dinogest. Depo-Provera is not something I like because it's very profound effect. Continuous oral contraceptive is another example. Implanon, I've never tried, but I think this is another option. But it is important for them to take one of these because as, as that, what Dr. Rudy said, however much we ablate the adenomyosis, I told you we can't do 100% of the adenomyosis. We may do 60, maybe 70% if we are lucky, 
whatever remaining is going to come back. So we need to suppress those from coming back by giving this medication until the patient wants to get pregnant. So I'll give you an example of a girl that this is a 23-year-old lady with a severe adenomyosis and the whole posterior wall was involved and even the anterior wall. We did an ablation for her. This the MRI after one day, okay, decent and ablation, not fantastic. And, um, and this is three months later. It, 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 it has shrunk very nicely. And this is my ultrasound findings. This is uh, before HIFU, the volume was 382.78 centimeter cubes. This was three months after the HIFU, it was 212.35. And then she disappeared. She didn't take any medication. She didn't come back. And 10 months later, and the reduction here is 44.5%. And 10 months later, when she came back, the volume has increased to 330, almost close to this, maybe only about 20% uh, reduction. So this has made me learn a lesson that we need to be very careful and counsel the patient that after the three months, they have to take some kind of treatment so that the adenomyosis doesn't recur. Now, let's look, let me look at this group of patients, which I don't like, the patient who is keen on spontaneous pregnancy. So here, also, we need to be very careful in the ablation without involvement of the endometrium. And we, I give them GnRH analog for three months. If it's unable to conceive within three months, I strongly consider them as uh, assisted conception. Now, many of these patients have been married for many years and wanting to uh, 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 get pregnant on their own. But if they don't conceive, then I will seriously have to talk to them that if you do not do anything about it, you will get your adenomyosis back. So you've got to consider assisted reproductive technique. So here's an example of a patient. This patient has got a large adenomyosis. It was 13 centimeters by seven centimeters, the whole uterus. I did ablation for her. I did a fairly good job. I thought this is an anterior adenomyosis. Anterior adenomyosis are easier to do than posterior adenomyosis. There was a question just now because it is more easily available and we can control the, the ablation and it, the chances of it involving the endometrium is also lesser. This one day after the high flu, and this is, Three months after the hypo, the uterus has shrunk. The adenomyosis looks very good, but I am worried for her. I, she wants to get pregnant on her own. I said, you go and try. If you cannot, by six months, I think you should do IVF. So this is, a, this is that same patient. Before hypo, her volume of the uterus was 396 centimeter cubed. Three months, it was 178, a reduction of 55%. I'm telling you, this is not the adenomyosis, but the whole uterus, there's a reduction of 55%. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that she will get pregnant on her own. If not, we will probably have to advise her to do IVF. So in conclusion, adenomyosis is a very difficult problem. I think all of us know if you have a patient with adenomyosis, especially if the adenomyosis is large, it is a very difficult problem. It's more difficult when the patient wants to conceive. Studies have shown that success rate in reducing menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea is up to 85%. Not all adenomyosis skills are the same. In some, Ablation is easy. In others, it can be very difficult. In women with adenomyosis who have difficulty in conceiving, especially after failed IVF, HIFU is a good option to shrink the adenomyosis before frozen embryo transfer. I've, showed, I've given you two examples. This is from my limited uh, experience for the last one year. There are many challenges in performing HIFU for these patients, including how much to ablate and how to avoid the endometrium. And in many patients, even however I control the ablation, I still hit the endometrium. And I think in my mind, it doesn't matter if you hit the endometrium. The next difficulty is to decide when is the best time to do the frozen embryo transfer. I am suggesting that it should be done at three months post high food. I also learned from my colleague that we can use CA125 to decide whether, it's, uh, whether we can do embryo transfer. So uh, now routinely I do the CA125 before I do uh, ablation. And then just before transfer, we do a CA125 again. And when the CA125 reach normal value, then it's a good time to do an embryo transfer. There's no necessity to wait for the next periods. HIFU can also be done in patients who have adenomyosis who want to conceive spontaneously, but she must be prepared to repeat the high food treatment if she did not conceive and the adenomyosis recurs. This is something that I keep repeating, telling my patients that if you don't uh, get pregnant fast, it will come back and I have to repeat the, 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 the treatment. And I also tell them that you have to consider IVF earlier in these patients. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Selva, for that extensive uh, lecture. The floor now is open for questions. Um, let me see the chat box. The first question is from Dr. Silao. Dr. Selva, have you encountered fistula formation as a complication? Um, I don't understand fistula. Fistula from where to where? If you are looking at uh, uh, whether there will be fistulation from the endometrium to the skin, there is, it is possible. It is possible. I, I, uh, it has been reported. Uh, but other problem is bowel injury, of course, we, that Dr. Dr. Rudy has, uh, has, uh, has uh, said. So uh, I, I don't understand from where the fistula formation. Is it from the adenomyosis to the endometrium? Yes, there will be, there will be, there will be some, kind, some kind of fistula there because the adenomyosis, when it involves the endometrium, the, the, the disease from the adenomyosis will just, as what Dr. Rudy said, will fall off into the endometrial cavity and come out to the, uh, to the, to the cervix. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a follow-up questions regarding the involvement of the endometrium. If you have done extensive ablation in a patient who is not desirous of getting pregnant, uh, are there reported cases of a patient becoming amenorrheic? Currently, I, I, am, I have not read about it, but I think technically it's possible. So the, the teaching from the, the company that makes it, which is for Chongqing Haifu, is try, not, try to avoid uh, ablating the endometrium. We, we try our best to avoid. But in my mind, that would be a good thing. In fact, if a patient doesn't want to get pregnant, if you do extensive ablation and the whole endometrium is ablated, then you, uh, for the patient not getting pregnant is a good thing. But I do not have a, a data to say that this is something that is that commonly happens. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Why is the recurrence of adenomyosis very fast after high food? Okay, as I said earlier, um, adenomyosis, uh, when we do ablation of uh, any structure, for example, the fibroid or an adenomyosis, we have to have a safety margin. And the safety margin is given to be about 15 millimeters to 20 millimeters from the serosa and from the endometrium. So you can, uh, you can understand that the endometrium, that the, the adenomyosis that we are ablating is within the adenomyotic area. So there will be a layer of adenomyosis that is all around the, uh, the, the adenomyosis. So you will definitely have adenomyosis left in the uterus, whether you like it or not. So that's the reason why I'm trying to emphasize that when we do treatment for patients who have, who want to conceive and those patients who do not want to conceive, it is different. We can give more energy to a patient who do not want to conceive to ablate more tissues. So we, when you ablate more tissues, whatever that is left behind will be lesser and the chances of it recurring will be lesser. Whereas if you are doing on somebody who want to get pregnant, you don't want to ablate too much because you're worried that it will involve the endometrium. Of course, you want to, you want to involve the serosa because the bowel may be stuck to the serosa. You don't want to burn the bowel. So that is the reason why it recurs. How fast it recurs will depend on the experience of the doctor and the amount the, pa the patient, uh, and of course, the type of patient. That's the reason why recurrence rate is there. Uh, so if you don't want recurrence to occur, then you have to give medical treatment after the adenomyosis ablation. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. So if the yeah. patient does not want to get pregnant, you do say 60% of the adenomyosis you have ablated, you put in a marina in, that marina will cause no bleeding and hopefully the adenomyosis will take a longer time to repair. It will recur, but it will not be so fast. That is the advantage. So another advantage is when we give ablation, we are shrinking the uterus. So the marina will sit in the correct place as opposed to a uterus that is 20 week size. You put the marina, it's not going to sit there. So there's a bigger advantage. So you're shrinking the uterus. So the chances of the marina sitting there and working will be better. So that's, that's probably the biggest advantage of uh, of high food for adenomyosis. So one must understand that treating uh, adenomyosis is different from treating fibroid. If you kill 80% of the fibroid, if you have a non-perfusion volume of 80% of a fibroid, because it's within the capsule, the fibroid will die and shrink. It is not the same for adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is all over the place. 
you are only treating what is there. Whatever is you are not treated is going to grow back. And that is a that is explanation for it. Okay. Uh, another question: If the patient don't conceive spontaneously after HIFO uh, plus three months of GnRH and six months of home coitus, no, or spontaneous wanting to have spontaneous pregnancy, uh, would you repeat HIFO treatment before embryo transfer? Uh I will have to see how well the treatment has been given and how the patient's symptom is. Probably when you do CA125. So it say, say a patient who wants to conceive undergoes, uh, undergoes a patient who undergoes high food treatment and, and we give the general analog for three months and then we wait for a menses to come, which will probably take four, five, six months later. And then she tries to get pregnant for six months and she didn't get pregnant. Then we have to look at the uterus, how it, it is looking. If it looks good, say it, it doesn't look enlarged, then probably we don't have to repeat the high food. If it doesn't, which I think will, that is what it's going to be because it's going to grow back, then you probably have to do another high food treatment before you can do a frozen embryo transfer. So I think in, in my mind, uh, the best patients are the patients who have undergone IVF and have done an embryo transfer and failed and they come to you. So they have got no other choice. The patients who have not had an embryo transfer, I will always talk to them and see if the uterus is 20 week size or 16 week size, I think there's no question that we have to do a uh, high food. But the uterus is say 14 week size or 12 week size, there's a small focus of adenomyosis in the uterus. Then whether the patient should actually undergo high food before the frozen embryo transfer is questionable. I would prefer actually for them to do the embryo transfer and test to see whether they can get pregnant or not. If they cannot, then come for the high food. So I will talk to them to see whether they are, they are, it is necessary for, for them to do the, the, the high food treatment. So I'm not saying that every patient who have adenomyosis must have high food treatment. What I'm saying is that those who fail and those who have very big uteruses, they are very, very good for high food. But those who have smaller uteruses and very mild adenomyosis, I will not do high food for them. Okay, thank you. Are there many, still many questions? Uh, is the presence of necrotic tissue within the endometrial cavity a contraindication to embryo transfer? I am not sure. I, I don't know the answer to this. So if, if, if the endometrial cavity has been involved, I would suggest that we do a hysteroscopy, clear it up, and then do the embryo transfer. Okay. Now, uh, I, I don't know how many of you all have done uh, hysteroscopy on an adenomyotic patient with the adenomyosis involving the cavity. Actually, I've done a few, I forgot to put it up. You can see that one wall of the, uh, of the uterus, especially the posterior wall, is filled with adenomyosis. Now, if, if it is already filled with adenomyosis, how can the patient still get pregnant? So if you have ablated it, it probably gives a better chance for her to conceive because the anterior wall is, is, uh, is, is good for the treatment. So in my mind, we don't know the answer to this question. I think we need, we need studies and we need maybe even case studies to, un to understand this before we can, uh, we can uh, answer this question. I think the next question is related to the previous question. Do you do routine per routinely perform diagnostic hysteroscopy after hypo treatment? For adenomyosis and when? I do not. I do not. I do not. Maybe I should. I should do a. I should uh, do a, uh, a, a office hysteroscopy or do a hysteroscopy before HIFU and then after HIFU to see how they are. I'm not doing them because many of my adenomyosis patients are actually uh, Virgo intactas. They are single women with adenomyosis. The one who are who are uh, what you call as pregnant. Uh, the, the ones who want to get pregnant, we will do the, the uh, hysteroscopy, but it is added cost for the patient. So uh, if they do, do not want to, we do not. But I think if you want to be scientific about it, then you should do a office. You do, should do a hysteroscopy before, and then after the hypho, you should do after that, and then only do the embryo transfer. But we have not been doing that. Okay, another question. Will you consider hypho as first line treatment for adenomyosis or fibroid distorting uterine cavity? or still trying IVF first? I think- uh... That is a very good question. Uh, let, me, let me look at uh, fibroids first. Now, I have already done two cases like this. Um, I've actually written a paper on this. Uh, the paper is, 
intramural fibroid, non-cavity distorting intramural fibroid, should you do, what is the best option for this patient? There's enough study to say, say that if you have a three centimeter fibroid, it actually reduces pregnancy. It doesn't, it, it reduces pregnancy rate and this has been well established. So what are we going to do with a not, don't say distorting, uh, uterine distorting, but non, even non-distorting uterine, uh, uterine uh, cavity distorting uterine fibroids. Now I've seen this patient who has got three or four, uh, four centimeter fibroids and she has already done IVF, she has got embryos, she has done embryo transfer and embryo transfer failed. So now I am in a dilemma as to whether to do a laparoscopic myomectomy on this patient or should I do a HIFU to shrink the fibroid? So we discussed and in my mind, I think HIFU will be a less, uh, what do you call it, less invasive method to shrink this fibroid than to go and do a laparoscopic myomectomy where I have to make multiple cuts and take out the fibroid and suturing it back. So I have already done two patients and I, I, I don't think this has ever been done or published. I think even in China, uh, people are doing fibroids for the large fibroids to symptomatic treatment, not for infertility. But this is something that I'm looking at that we could actually do this patients, I'm not talking about the huge fibroids that you actually have to do a myomectomy, but the smaller fibroids that is cavity distorting or mildly cavity distorting, then we can give the option of HIFU for these patients rather than doing a lab, uh, myomectomy for these patients. I, I hope I answered that question. As for, as, for, as for adenomyosis, I will never, use, I will never say that adenom, uh, HIFU is the first line option for an infertility patient with adenomyosis. What I will say is that if the patient has failed uh, IVF treatment, she will be a good candidate because I don't want her to turn around and say that my HIFU is the one that caused her not to get pregnant. So I would be very happy if they have failed everything and then they come to me, I do HIFU. But we also see patients who are young, say like the girl I showed you, a 20, uh, 23 year old or 24 year old with uh, adenomyosis and she's suffering from pain and menorrhagia. Will I do HIFU for her? Yes, I will do HIFU for her in the hope that later she will be able to get uh, you know, married and get pregnant. So I will not say that HIFU is the first line treatment for adenomyosis. Uh, what, what I will say is it's an option I'll give the patient. If I could treat it by medical treatment, I will do that. I will give her Dinoges, Depo Provera injection, Mirina, whatever. And if she's still resistant to that treatment, then I'll consider HIFU. I, I hope I answered the answer that question. We, will, we don't want to use HIFU as first line. What, what, what we want to do is that for patients who are refractory, we will consider HIFU. Okay, uh, question from Dr. Dean. Uh, he said, uh, what an inspired speech. I have two questions. The first question is about the timing of embryo transfer after HIFU. Why the size of adenomyosis matter rather than the regain of MC? Then the second question, let's say a patient with diffuse type adenomyosis get pregnant after high food. What is your recommendation for her way of delivery? Why is uterine rupture a concern for this kind of patient by home? Okay, let me look. I, I have to look at the question again. I am seeing it. What about timing? Okay, why does the size of adenomyosis matter rather than the, rather than the rather than regain the what is MC regain of MC, menstruation? Okay, um, in in my mind, I think the size does matter. Um, uh, when we do ablation of adenomyosis, we are trying to kill the adenomyotic not, tissue, and also we want to shrink the uterus. In my mind, the larger the uterus, the larger the uterus, I, I don't have the evidence, larger the uterus, probably implantation rate will be lesser. I, I, I cannot give you evidence-based medicine for this. Um, the, the smaller the size of the uterus, probably it will be less, uh, less uh, what do you call as, less, uh, better, probably there'll be a better chance of uh, pregnancy. I am not sure whether that is, that, 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 that is a, a valid statement to make. I don't think anybody can tell you that. So that is the reason why I want the uterus to be as small as possible for, uh, for embryo transfer rather than making it grow back and then do the embryo transfer. So to, uh, to, to give you a proper answer, I don't know whether that, that, is, that, is the, that is the right thing to do, but in my mind, that probably is a better option 
then waiting for menstrual cycle when the uterus grows back and then put the embryo transfer. So let's say a patient with diffuse type adenomyosis get pregnancy after HIFU. What is your recommendation for a way of delivery? Why is uterine rupture a concern for this kind of patient? Yeah, in my mind, I think, I, I mean, there are enough uh, evidence, there are enough studies, there are enough patients who have delivered uh, normally, uh, who a patient who have undergone HIFU for adenomyosis. So because we are not uh, disrupting the serosa, at least the serosa, probably the endometrium will have disrupted, but the serosa, I think her chances of having a uterine rupture is not, is not high. So she could deliver normally. And there are many patients who have delivered normally, but this is not randomized control trial, it's just case studies. And in fact, uh, I didn't put up those case studies, but there are enough patients who have actually delivered normally. Okay, I think I've answered that question. Uh, okay. Because of the time constraints, uh, Dr. Selba will just answer the, the questions no, through the chat box. Thank you very much.